Yes. Okay. All right, so the people from outside also attending. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello, Kaima. I'll, uh, 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 I'll, uh, yeah, I'll meet you. Yeah, okay. E e yeah. So, um, okay, let's start. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, four past two. So, our speaker today is uh, Daniel uh, Netherwood. Uh, he is a PhD student in the School of Mathematics, uh, second year student. Is it right, Danny? Yeah. Second year, so the, he already did uh, many things, uh, and uh, his uh, um, thesis is in good shape, as I understand. <laughs> That's very good. And uh, definitely, uh, uh, Daniel is a very talented which, uh, researcher, which was clear uh, even when he was the uh, undergraduate student uh, with us. So he was well visible that time. So we start uh, our uh, seminar. Seminar uh, today. Uh, the seminar is recorded, so uh, with permission from uh, Daniel. Uh, uh, and um, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, that's all. Then, uh, uh, please, uh, uh, um, Daniel, please uh, keep your um, uh, camera on, yeah. and uh, I will switch off my camera and mute my microphone. So uh, the uh, everything uh, uh, up to you. If uh, there are some problems with internet, I will yeah. uh, return back and let you know. So the because of some reasons, uh, everything may happen. So the but uh, uh, if not, uh, then the uh, all the time uh, is yours. At the end, uh, we will have time for uh, questions, uh, for discussions, and uh, uh, literally the time is not limited. So the we can yeah. take. So the uh, now I switch off my uh, camera and uh, my microphone and Danny, please start your presentation. <clears throat> well, brilliant. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak. As you know, I'm a regular attendee at this seminar and uh, we given the current uh, situation, we haven't really been given. Uh, we haven't had an amazing amount of opportunity to be able to talk about the things that I have done. Um, so I'm looking forward to being able to explain some of the results that um, myself and my supervisors have found over this last year and a year or so. Um, so the, the title is a new solution for the deformation of an elastic walled tube using a generalized eigenvalue problem. And the kind of the main uh, idea here is to show this new method that we've that we've used to be able to find a formal solution to a partial differential equation. Um, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but the overall goal of this talk is for me to be able to present and solve um, a system of differential equations that measure the way in which an elastic wall tube will deform when we apply a, a pressure to its a, a pressure to it. Um, so the, the talk will be split up essentially into two components. So I'm going to have a brief introduction to collapsible tube flow, and th this will be useful because it will help us to motivate the research that we've been doing and, and, and why we would like to know the results that we have. And then I'll get straight into the kind of the main thrust of the talk and set up a physical problem, explain how my supervisor, Dr. Robert Whitaker, went about solving it in the, in the first place, and then show why we've provided a, a better way of doing things. And that's kind of the main, um, the underlying points behind this, this talk. Um, we'll conclude by presenting some results that we've got, and then there'll be some time for some questions at the end. Um, so whilst we are at this stage, so my primary supervisor is Dr. Robert Whitaker, who's, and a lot of these results that I'm talking about today will be directly associated with some research that's been done by him. And my secondary supervisor, who's not necessarily done as much with me, but we hope to get him involved. Um, he's been there to, if I have any problems, he'll always help me, and that's Dr. Paul Hamilton as well. Um, so an introduction to collapsible tube flow. So we're interested in this relationship between the elasticity of some kind of vessel that's conveying some fluid and this um, fluid will have, there will be some fluid structure interaction between the structure and of course the 
what is generally a biological fluid that's conveyed within it. Um, so some obvious examples will be the circulatory system. So you have the classic example of a of blood that is um, kind of cascading out of the left ventricle and going through the aorta. And there is some strong, um, the elasticity of the aorta uh, has a, an important role to play in that um, in that motion and supplying nutrients um, through the anatomy. Um, some slightly more um, extreme uh, cases of fluid structure interaction might be the rupture of cerebral and arterial aneurysms. Um, being able to predict and understand why things have happened in, in such harsh um, conditions um, might be very, very important in a medicinal uh, or in the, the, the medicinal sciences. Um, one other example that I'll talk about is um, the collapsibility of veins. So although it sounds somewhat extreme, veins do collapse regularly, especially in regions above the neck and outside of the skull. So there will be um, essentially you will have a reduction in hydrostatic pressure, which is suffice to induce collapse. And this happens in particular when we're doing things like exercise. Um, and and we will we will kind of see um, the way in which some of these vessels will collapse during the talk. Um, some examples that are not necessarily in the circulatory system is the respiratory system. So we get the generation of respiratory noises, which are as a result of flow instabilities between the elasticity of the airway walls and the airflow that's going through them. Um, so we can see that there are numerous examples of um, why we would want to understand relationships between elastic wall tubes and the complex biological fluids that are conveyed within them. So before we start to talk about theoretical models, um, I think it's important that we talk about the Starling resistor, which is where uh, experiments are typically conducted. So the setup is a some section of elastic tube. So you would have some elast elasticated tube and you would pin that between two rigid tubes and place the setup in a pressure chamber. And the reason why we do this is because it allows us to alter the ambient pressure on the exterior of the tube. And then this difference between the internal and the external pressure creates some interesting physics that we'd like to analyze. Um, so if we want to drive fluid through the system and see how that interacts with the um, elasticity of the tube, then what we would typically see is a pressure drop at either end of the tube and then you would have the classic Bernoulli problem where fluid will flow from pressures of high to, to low and you would get an upstream velocity that way. So when we're in this experimental, um, when we're thinking about the experimental results then what we, what scientists have observed is that a quantity known as the transmural pressure which is the difference between the internal and the external pressure essentially control, controls the collapsibility of the tube um, so if we think about if we split the the transmural pressure values of the transmural pressure will take into three different into three distinct regions. So first of all, positive transmural pressures. So that will be where the internal pressure outweighs the external pressure by some amount. Then the tube will have an inflammatory configuration. Uh, it will be quite distensible and deformations within this configuration are generally stretches. Um, so they're the kind of deformations that we will observe there. If we think about small negative transmural pressures, then at this stage, the uh, external pressure is starting to outweigh the internal pressure. And in this configuration, the tube will buckle non axisymmetrically and you will obtain a sort of elliptical configuration. Um, and in this state, uh, deformations are generally caused by bending motion, which is obviously quite converse to the, to the previous example. When we're in this regime, small changes in the transmural pressure create large changes in cross-sectional area and this is quite important when we're thinking about the models that I'll discuss in a bit more detail. So if we increase the external pressure such that the transmural pressure becomes sufficiently negative, the, um, the tube will buckle into a two-lobed state as you can see here. I've sort of, I've sketched some the kind of uh, the, the way in which this tube will deform um, in the figure at the bottom here. And then eventually, if it comes negative enough, then the opposing walls will come into contact first at a point, and then they will kind of continue along to just become a straight line. So that's the way in which that this tube will deform. Um, so with the experimental results in mind, it is useful to think about writing this as mathematics. And 
I've put a very basic um, one dimensional theoretical model, which includes the average axial velocity of a, uh, an elastic wall tube. And rather than just going into the detail, I just think it's important that we that we look at the fluid structure interaction. And this this will show why the thing that we're deriving in the I'm going to present is important. So if we think about an average axial velocity, a fluid pressure and the tube's cross section, then we have a mass conservation statement. We have a momentum conservation statement. And we would only have two um, with these two equations alone. We would have three um, variables and two and two um, equations. So in order to be able to close this system, we require a third equation which relates the internal pressure to the change in cross sectional area. And this is what's known as a tube law. And it is a tube law that we're going to derive and present solutions for today. So we can see that there is some strong uh, coupling between the fluid and the structure in this example, even though it's only one dimensional. And that's because if we think about a change in velocity, the momentum equation is going to result in a change in pressure. And a change in pressure is going to give us a change in cross-sectional area using the tube law here. And then using the conservation of mass equation, if our area is changing, we're going to get a subsequent change in velocity profile as well. And then we're going to get this kind of cyclic um, interaction between the three variables like this. So I hope that this uh, provides enough motivation as to why having an accurate tube law is really, really important to be able to capture the mechanics of the tube. So some examples of some tube laws that have been proposed in the past. So the most common one which was used for a long time was by Flaherty in 1972, who considered the deformations of an inextensible elastic ring when subjected to a uniform pressure. And he modeled the, the transmural pressure, the difference in pressures, as some function of the local cross-sectional area. And for what we are trying to do, that is not going to be um, enough because there is an obvious issue which is that if you're thinking about a ring then understanding the way in which that cross section the cross section layer of the ring changes is useful but what that does not take into account is any axial forces or bending moments or anything like this and this is going to have an effect on the way in which our tube will deform so in 1981 mcclurkin was the first to um essentially tried to fix this problem and introduced contributions from axial tension. He also introduced contributions from axial bending as well, but I've only included the tensional effects here. And uh, Rain also considered um, some additional terms which include axial effects as well. The problem, the problem with their approach was that they assumed that the um, these tensional effects could be included additively to the problem to the tube law sorry so you have this local pressure area relationship and then you include an additive term which is the tension proportional to the curvature of the tube and the way in which that this term was derived was by making an assumption or that the tube takes an idealized geometry when it's deforming now this is not something that you necessarily want to do because as we've seen from the previous um, what i was speaking about previously small changes in pressure create large changes in cross-sectional area so it's not the best idea to be able to assume that your deformed geometry that your deformed tube takes a specific geometry ideally what we would like to do is have a rational derivation of a tube law that uses the theory of linear elasticity and fluid mechanics etc to be able to understand the way in which a tube will deform as we apply pressure to it and this is where the work from my um, supervisor comes in so in 2010 um, Robert and some of his collaborators provided a rational derivation of a tube law from shell theory. And what they did not do was model the deformed tube as an as an idealized ge geometry. So they took an initial um, a tube in its initial geometry and said, how is this tube going to deform? So um, what his model included was contributions due to axial tension and azimuthal bending and also um, these additional derivatives due to the curvature allows you to capture the tube end effects, the pinned end tube effects that we saw from the Stalling resistor case. And as I've as I've as I'm going to repeat, um, he does not model the deformed tube as an idealized geometry, although he does invoke an ad hoc assumption on how to solve um, the problem, which we fix. So the physical setup is that we consider a long thin walled tube of length L, wall thickness D. 
uh, the tube is initially axially uniform and has a it has an initially axially uniform electrical cross section of circumference two pi a, um, as is the case in the stalag resistor, where pinning the tube at both ends and applying an axial pre-stress uh, of magnitude f over two pi a d, um, stretching the tube at either end. So how is this tube going to deform? So we're going to assume that the tube wall is linearly elastic and behaves isotropically. And we're going to assume that the deformations of the tube are induced by a dimensionless transmural pressure, P tilde, which as defined previously is the difference between the internal and the external pressure. If we want to um, progress analytically, then we think about some asymptotic regimes for which the tube is long and thin, and they correspond to the geometric ratios delta over A being small and L over A being large. Here, delta is the thickness of the tube and A scales with the circumference, and, uh, in this, and L is the length of the tube. So if delta is small and L is large, then the tube is long and thin. Um, so some slightly less obvious asymptotic regimes that help us provide some analytical results is setting epsilon, which is the size of the deformations of the tube, um, to be A cubed times by the scale for the transmural pressure divided by uh, capital K, the stiffness coefficient. Um, so when you do scaling analysis on the governing equations, which I'm going to go into, um, you find that if you want the pressure to be present at leading order, which of course you will do, then it will have to balance the largest term in those equation in the governing equations. And in order to be able to do this, you need to make sure that you set your deformations to be this size, which are then small, if we want small amplitude deformations. Now it turns out that contributions from azimuthal bending, which are present in the leading order equilibrium equations, are of size epsilon k over a cubed. So if you so in order to make that term balance with the transmural pressure, epsilon has to be this. Um, similarly, if we want um, tension effects to be um, present in the leading order equilibrium equations, then this combination of parameters, which we've called F, which he called F tilde, if you set that to be order one, then contributions from axial curvature become the same size as the uh, azimuthal bending and therefore the same size as the transmural pressure. So you get all of these terms in the leading order equilibrium equations, which is what you would want for an interesting problem. <clears throat> so the tube's midplane is parameterized by the dimensionless coordinates tau z. So tau is the um, is the arc length in the azimuthal and z is the axial distance, respectively. <clears throat> so how does this tube deform? So this is this was derived by Robert and his colleagues, and he said that the tube in its deformed configuration is going to be where it was initially, plus some small displacement. And the coefficient, the various prefactors in this equation, uh, they make the dimensional scales consistent and also make sure that the uh, amplitudes of the deformations are small. Um, so here, psi is the displacement of the tube normal to the tube wall. Eta is the azimuthal displacement. Uh, zeta is the axial displacement that has azimuthal variation, and zeta a is the axial displacement that's been azimuthally averaged. There are two functions of displacement for the axial direction, because there are two different physical mechanisms, and they have different sizes, so you need different functions to be able to uh, describe them. So r bar in this case is the canonical representation for uh, an ellipse, and um, h of tau is a dimensionless function, which is the scale factor for the elliptical coordinate system. So some important parameters which are to be thought about is that here c is a normalization factor which sets the um, tube circumference to be two pi a, and sigma naught, which I'm going to talk about a lot in our results, that sets the ellipticity of the tube. Um, so we think about sigma naught. If sigma naught is large, then we have a circular cross section. If sigma naught is small, then we're getting more and more elliptical. Um, to the point where we would eventually just have a line of sigma not tended towards zero. So to be able to model the, the elasticity of the tube, the thin tube wall, then what Robert and his colleagues did was use uh, kirchhoff shell theory, which makes some assumptions based on the normal component of the shell, and it reduces the three-dimensional elasticity equations to two dimensions and allows us for some um, analytical progress. <clears throat> so these equations that we obtain, there are three equations and they're they measure the equilibrium of forces in the normal azimuthal and axial directions. And these are in terms of the stress resultants and bending moments for the tube. 
Um, if you then think, if you then, uh, you can then relate the displacement functions xi, eta, zeta, and zeta a uh, to these uh, stress resultants and bending moments to obtain the leading order equilibrium equations. So what you have at this stage is you would have a system of three equations in terms of the displacements, and we want to be able to um, essentially find what these displacements are to be able to solve, to find the solution to this problem. Um, so given that we have four displacement functions, it would be much easier if we were able to transform the problem in terms of only one of them. And we can do that by um, using the fact that there is negligible azimuthal stretching and that the in-plane shear is uniform in each cross-section. So these physical results again come from the scale analysis of the problem, but what they allow us to do just mathematically is it provides us a relationship between the normal displacement psi and the azimuthal displacement eta, and similarly it provides a it provides a um, relationship between the azimuthal displacement and the axial displacement. There isn't an inextensibility constraint necessary for the other axial displacement because that just decouples naturally. It's only present in one of the axial in the axial force balance once. So I've kind of glossed over that reasonably quickly, so we can get to the re results that that um, that I can show you, and that is. Um, the leading order equilibrium equations, once if you use the inextensibility constraints, will allow you to formulate the problem in terms of only one of the displacement functions, and that's the azimuthal displacement. And the resulting partial differential equation, which essentially now governs the whole problem, because if we know what the displacement eta is, then we can get the others for free. Then what we what what we have here is we have a sixth order linear partial differential equation in the azimuthal coordinate tau. Um, the um, first term here represents contributions from azimuthal bending. The second, the second term represents contributions from the axial curvature effects, and that's why we have a second uh, order axial derivative here. P tilde of Z is the dimensionless transmural pressure. CP is a function of the ellipticity of the problem, and H is that scale factor that I defined earlier. The linear operators L, K, and J, which are in the governing equation, um, again, you don't need to pay too much uh, attention as to what these are. I've included them in for completeness. But uh, L and K are third order differential operators and J is second. So L, K when combined give a sixth order one. And that's these are what constitute our uh, governing equation. The full boundary value problem is then our PDE with pinned end conditions because we want the azimuthal displacements to be fixed to be zero at either end of the deck the dimensionally analyzed tube and we also have some azimuthal boundary conditions uh, from the uh, from the symmetry of the tube and that's that the even derivatives of eta vanish um, when tau is between naught and pi by two the symmetry of this problem allows us to restrict from naught to pi down to naught not to pi by two so my supervisor um robert and his colleagues um opted to solve the governing equation by introducing a Fourier decomposition for the azimuthal displacement. And then the idea then is that we need to find a way to decouple the axial modes E and of Z. And the way that he did this was he said that essentially the first mode was going to be by far the most dominant and the terms after that could be ignored. And he calculated it and showed that you could that the second terms were going to be small in comparison to the first one and truncated this series at n equals one and introduced alpha of z, which is the relative area change. So that tells us how much the um, cross sectional area has changed. Uh, that is proportional to the axial mode E1 of z. And then they were able to deduce a tube law, which is a second order differential equation in terms of the uh, relative area change alpha forced by the um, dimensionless transmural pressure P tilde. So this is where my, this is where my solution uh, this is where my solution comes in. Um, sorry, there's a little bit of feedback here from I think it's Frank. Okay, I think that's all right. Thank you. Um, so this is where kind of the research that I that I've done, or that myself and Robert have done, come in. Um, and what we've done is we've provided a formal solution to the leading order system without needing to assert any ad hoc assumptions. We didn't need to do any truncations. And what's important about this is that it allows us to evaluate the error after truncation n equals one, which would be interesting to correspond to the work that was done by Robert. So 
the operators that are going to be present for the remainder of this talk are they now have hats on them and that's because i've introduced we introduced the linear scaling on the operators this was purely for numerical benefit for when we are um doing our presenting our numerical solutions um for the purpose of this talk just think that they're exactly the same we've just multiplied the both sides of the equation by tan squared two sigma naught doesn't affect what it is that i'm going to talk about um so if we're thinking about how we're going to try and solve this equation, it would be nice to be able to relate the operators L, K and J together. And the way that we do this is by introducing a generalized eigenvalue problem, which simplifies the problem. We then use properties of that generalized eigenvalue problem to be able to sum over those over the eigenfunctions of the eigenvalue problem. And what this allows us to do is find a formal solution and decouple some axial nodes. OK. The generalized eigenvalue problem that we use to help us with this problem, with this uh, solution, is L k of y minus lambda j of y, and you hopefully you can see that if we can if we have this relationship between L k and j, that's going to simplify this governing equation somewhat, and we've kept the uh, boundary conditions from the azimuthal displacements, but this time they're ordinary derivatives because we've dropped the z dependence. So we're only thinking about the eigenvalue problem in terms of tau because L and K are linear differential operators in, in tau. So these we have a sixth order ODE in this case and we have six boundary conditions, but this is an eigenvalue problem. So we have an additional degree of freedom by the norm, by the um, eigenvalue, presence of the eigenvalue. And this remaining degree of freedom will lie within the normalization of the eigenfunctions. Um, typically, what you would do with a problem like this is you would just say that I want to set the gradient at zero to be one. But for the purpose of what we're doing, it's we can introduce a more useful normalization that will help us later. So we've proven some important results associated with this generalized eigenvalue problem. So with respect to the inner product given here, um, the operators L, K and J are self adjoint on the space of functions that satisfy the boundary conditions. And this in turn allows us to prove some interesting things. So as, as almost the halfway point, whilst you're proving that L, K and J are self adjoint, you also get the fact that uh, L, K and J must be positive definite. So you arrive at a sum of squares and you, that enables you to be able to prove that L, K and J are positive definite. And this is useful because it allows us to define an alternative normalization condition uh, which I'll talk about in a second. So we derive an orthogonality relationship between the eigenfunctions yn and ym. So if yn and ym satisfy the eigenvalue problem, then it is true that when you integrate over the region um, and you have one over h, yn times by j applied to ym, if n is not equal to m, then this integral will vanish. Uh, this therefore allows us to introduce the normalization condition that when the n is equal to m, then we will set this integral equal to 1, and this will help us. So a very important property of the eigenfunctions of the generalized eigenvalue problem is that they form a complete set of eigenfunctions. So this is very much a non-trivial argument. It took us a long time to be able to prove this result. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go into the details in this talk, but I would be happy to answer any questions if anyone would like to know at the end. Um, so what we've proven is that the is that if you take any um, any function in our function space that satisfies the boundary conditions, then you can represent that function as a sum over the eigenfunctions of the generalized eigenvalue problem. So there will exist a sequence of constants a n such that we can have this sum that's given here, and we're going to use this property to sum over the azimuthal to sum. We're going to write the um, the azimuthal displacement as a sum of the eigenfunctions of the generalized eigenvalue problem, and this will allow us to decouple um, the equations. So for completeness, I've included the numerical solutions for the eigenfunctions, and you can kind of see that these eigenfunctions are indicative of something that would be would form a complete set. Um, if you take the limit as the uh, cross section of the tube becomes circular, you get uh, precisely Fourier mode, so you do get a Fourier series in that case, so that's a good sign as well. And then what we see is that as you increase the mode, you increase the number of oscillations linearly. So if we have, um, so we have one oscillation for mode one, two oscillations for mode two, etc. 
And then similarly, we have the numerical solutions for the eigenvalues. And although this isn't doesn't have too much of a physical um, meaning on the problem, what it does do allow us to do is think about the um, the sizes of the eigenvalues and how they're increasing um, by quite a lot as we increase the um, the solution mode. So now we get onto the generalized eigenvalue method, which is the whole point of why we've done what we've done, and that is to take our governing equation here and write the azimuthal displacement eta as a sum over the eigenfunctions of the eigenvalue problem. And our sequence of constants, which are now sequence of functions of the axial coordinate z, the problem is now to be able to write a system of equations for the axial modes a n of z. Um, and it will be this system that allows us to derive a tube law measuring the way in which this tube will deform. So I've omitted the details, but if you do substitute this expansion into the governing equation and you use the fact that um, the I, that the linear operators L, K and J are self-adjoint, and you also use the fact that Y, N is an eigenfunction of the generalized eigenvalue problem, what you find is that you can write the following second order differential system uh, for the axial modes a n of z forced by the dimension as transmural pressure. Um, the constant q n or the sequence of constants q n represent the contribution to the pressure from the nth eigen mode. Um, these are just a constant for what we're interested in. Um, they're calculated numerically using this formula given here. So to be able to derive the tube law, um, we want to consider the area, uh, the area displacement. So the difference between what the cross-sectional area was uh, and what it is now. Yeah. And you can show that the area displacement is given uh, by this integral of the normal displacement. Now, what I'm about to say, there's quite a few jumps in here, but using the inextensibility constraint uh, that there is negligible azimuthal stretching and leading order, you have a relationship between the normal displacement and the azimuthal displacement. So they're somewhat proportional. And if you can write your area displacement in terms of the azimuthal displacement, then what you can use is your sum over the eigenfunctions y of tau again. And that's why in our result, we end up with a sum. And then all we need to do is introduce a fractional area change. So this tells us how our area, this is, a, it tells us how our area has changed, um, which is what we're interested in, because these are, of course, indicative of the deformation. So if you introduce all these things together, then what you obtain is that alpha of z, which is the relative area change of the tube, uh, is given by the following sum over alpha n of z. And each alpha n is the contribution to the relative area change from the nth eigen mode. So what we have shown is that each contribution at each mode, so we're thinking about alpha as the sum alpha one, alpha two, alpha one we expect to be dominant because that's going to be uh, comparable to the work done by Robert um, 10 years ago or so. And each alpha n can be shown to satisfy this second order differential equation. So we have a second order system um, here where if we set n equals to one, we obtain the tube law which is what, which is um, directly associated with the tube law derived by by Robert. But then what we're interested in is what happens when we think about n equals two, n equals three. So these are these kind of correction terms. And now that we actually have a formula to be able to find the solutions for those correction terms, we can then um, understand the way in, we can then understand the error after truncation at n equals one. So the pinned end conditions, uh, they remain the same. They, the only difference is, uh, so they come directly from writing eta as this expansion here. Eta had to be zero at either end of the tubes. So does alpha n. Um, so what we can do is we can present solutions when we are given a uniform transmural pressure. So if we let p tilde be equal to um, minus one, then in this case, we can solve this differential equation analytically. So it's using standard methods from undergraduate um, calculus and subjected to the boundary conditions, we can obtain a solution for the relative area change alpha n of z. And so the solutions are given here. 
Uh, I've plotted them here. And in particular, what I'm going to draw your attention to in this first figure is that I've plotted the solutions by Robert and his colleagues over the top using this pentagonal marker system. And hopefully you can see that the results are very much um, in agreement with one another, which was very good for us because it means that not only was Robert's um, Robert's method very, very accurate, but it also means that we have agreement in our solutions. And importantly, if we look at alpha one, alpha two, alpha three and alpha four, alpha one being the leading mode and alpha two and beyond being the correction modes, um, they're very, very, the correction modes are very, very small in comparison to the leading order mode. So I've plotted, the curves that I've plotted are for a dimensionless axial tension, F tilde being three and one, and the ellipticity of the tube for these solutions was set at sigma naught equals 0 0.6. So, because obviously we wouldn't, we have to be able to think we've taken a specific tube of a specific ellipticity and found the results for that for a uniform pressure. So this brings us on to trying to find out in general, when is when are we going to have a good approximation and when can we truncate our expansions n equals one like Robert did? So for sigma naught equals, if we look back, for sigma naught equals 0 0.6, so that's a reasonably elliptical cross section, um, and axial tensions of F tilde being three and F tilde being one, um, what we see is that this is a pretty good approximation. So we have a 10 to the minus four correction term and we have 0 0.01, 0 0.02 leading order terms. So uh, this contour plot, which shows the ratio of alpha two over alpha one for a variety of different axial tensions and a variety of different cross sections, well, this tells us how good our approximation is going to be. So if you look at the bottom right of this, um, if you look at the bottom right hand side of this contour plot, you'll see that in regions of dark blue, where we're thinking that we this is a very good place to be truncating our series at n equals one. And that's because we have um, errors of about 10 to the minus 5.5. So the extreme case would be if alpha two over alpha one is one, you would be neglecting something the same size as what it is that you're keeping. So luckily for us, the smaller the value, the better it is. So sigma naught being 2.5, I've drawn, I've sketched the progression of the cross-sectional areas. So um, the far left elliptical cross-section corresponds to sigma naught being 0 0.1 and sigma naught being 2.5 is this uh, what was to be perceived as a circle when it's not quite a circle. Um, so when sigma naught is 2.5, we have a very circular cross-section and it doesn't really matter that much what our axial tension is, whether it's small or large, we're going to get a reasonable approximation even if we neglect our correction terms. Um, if, we, um, if we start to think about um, more elliptical cross-sections, then our error becomes larger. So we're starting to require uh, more and more correction terms in this case. So for example, we have a 10 to the minus one correction term if we have large ax dimensionless axial tensions and a very, very um, elliptical cross-section. So when we're in these, these regimes where we're thinking a very elliptical cross-section is where we start and, um, where and we have large axial tensions, we're probably going to need to include some more correction terms to be able to get a more accurate result. Um, so that is the end of my talk. So it's I've got through it a little bit quicker than I did when I gave this last week. Um, so here are the citations and there's um, time now if anybody has any, any questions about anything in this. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Very nice uh, work and good result. And, uh, 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 interesting uh, um, eigenvalue problem and uh, interesting in particular orthogonality condition in that. So the um, yeah, any uh, questions, please, to Daniel, or you can just unmute your microphone and ask question, or you can raise your hand and uh, after that you ask question, anything. E yeah. So <laughs> let me start. Uh, as to that uh, uh, eigenvalue problem, uh, you is it right to say that the solution of that problem is uh, the shapes of uh, um, uh, 
cross-section vibration uh, uh, of that shell uh, when the shell is close to ellipse? So the I don't think that the I that the solutions to the eigenvalue problem provide too too much f physical meaning for the um, for the for the actual cross sectional shape in the deformed configuration. The the thing that you want if you're thinking about it physically is what your alpha values are. So these alpha values here they tell you how much your cross sectional area has deviated. Um, from where it was initially, which is why if you look at Z at Z equals zero and Z equals one, which are the two ends of the tube, you have no deformation. And then you have a maximum at Z equals a half where you would have deformations of well, minus not point not four. If that I, yeah. I don't know uh, I don't know yeah. how the solution to the eigenvalue problem provides too much physical meaning. Yeah. Maybe Robert will know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Daniel, but, uh, can you return to your slide with the uh, eigenvalue problem? Yeah. Because as I remember, it's not with respect to alpha. It, yeah, it's with respect to y, and what the and y depends on tau, right? Yeah. And tau is azimuthal coordinate. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that is the uh, um, uh, in the that azimuthal direction. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, y, in some sense, it's distribution uh, 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 in the azimuthal uh, direction. So, uh, uh, and the, the equations uh, uh, you derive, you use, that is the equation of the shell. And uh, in that equation, you consider what's happening only in cross section for uh, z equal to constant, right? So then uh, that y, I do not know is it uh, has a meaning or not, but uh, it's uh, it's related to some behavior of the behavior of the. It, it definitely it definitely will. I presume it definitely does have some physical meaning behind it. But the way that I've known or thought about it is that it's a way. Uh, did you did you calculate that y of tall? Yeah. Yes, these, it, are it, these solutions. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, that is, yeah, 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 yeah. That is, yeah. And uh, you limit yourself to uh, tau from zero to pi over four because of symmetry of the shape, right? Yeah. Because it's a double symmetry. So that is, it's a could be, yeah, it could be related to the shapes. Uh, um, he, uh, Mark, Mark Cooker, could you uh, could you ask your question? Could be related to what we are discussing. Mark, hello, Danny. Yes, uh, yeah. I was just asking about the complexity of the um, computation of these individual uh, eigenfunctions. So perhaps you've answered this already. So the the um, the eigenfunctions weren't too difficult to compute you use we used we just used a built-in um ODE um boundary value problem solver there there was um it was it was reasonably difficult to obtain solutions for all sigma naught so what we found is that if you tried to solve this problem with a very with a very elliptical cross section we we weren't getting the solutions that we wanted um, and it, they required a little bit of fiddling about to be able to find solutions in in that case, but there wasn't too much comp com computational complexity really in, in solving the eigenvalue problem. Thank you. I was interested because it, it looks like it's a two point value problem, yeah. a boundary value problem, and they're, they're notorious. Yeah. So if you found yeah. this straightforward, then that's uh, very it's, good. It's it's linear which makes, so these operators, L, K, and J are linear in, in tau, uh, which makes okay. it much nicer. And it, it's it's not too dissimilar from any any ordinary eigenvalue problem. It just kind of mm -hmm. complicated. Mm -hmm. You have a nice number of boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. the, the, there's an interesting question in how do you, so initially we normalized the, the, um, the eigenfunctions to have a gradient of one at zero. And then we renormalize them later on, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't too difficult. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then it's uh, it yeah it would be uh, 
great to uh, understand what the meaning of uh, <laughs> so the to say it's not only mathematical, but uh, uh, there is the well, kind of physics. Maybe behind. Robert, uh, uh, Robert, Robert, please, could you? Um, so, so they're not vibrational modes per se, because there isn't an inertia term in there. Oh and yes, the the inertia term. Um, I have a feeling I might have done this in the dim and distant past to have a look. Um, you, you would potentially have another differential operator in front of eta. So, so you could imagine if you if you put inertia in, you get an extra term in the equation, which would be the I don't know mass mass per per unit area or something times some operator acting on eta. Uh, if you are lucky, the operator might be J or, or, or L times K or something like that, in, in which case then they probably would be the vibrational modes, but but for subtle reasons. Um, and I can't remember it, it. It might be that it's exactly J, in which case they would be vibrational modes, um, but but sort of by coincidence, I guess. Um, mm. It's an interesting question, though, Sasha, about about what what physical relevance they do actually have, and it it's it's to do with a mode that the if you alter the amplitude of it going along the length, the forces that you need to keep that deformation due to axial bending are kind of exactly in the same exactly the same function of tor as the forces you get from neighbouring modes because you've got a different amplitude in two places. Uh, so it's, a, it's it's sort of a, a coupling between azimuth or bending and the axial tension and curvature effects, and it's what yeah. deformation shapes yes. sort of work without without tripping off any other modes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, 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 the, yeah, clear. Thank you, thank you very much, Robert. Um, Sasha? Any other questions? Sasha? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Frank, please. Yes, uh, just to ask Daniel, um, what do you intend doing next with um, in this research? So we um, we have what we're going to do next is we're going to see if we can generalize this problem where the tube initially has an arbitrary cross section rather than being necessarily elliptical. Um, there's an interesting problem which Robert asked me about the other day, which is can we does there exist a cross-sectional shape such that there are no errors we were talking about now? I think that would be a reasonably difficult problem um, mm. because it would depend on a lot of different things I've talked about in this talk. But yeah, we're going to try and uh, how, how can we not think about the tube being initially elliptical and if we can vary that and start off with a bit more exotic shapes. Mm. Yes. Okay. Mm. Uh, how exotic would you go? Would you have, would you have corners and? I don't know. Corners sound a bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, uh, Robert, uh, uh, your hand is still up. So would you like to say something? Okay, no. Yeah. Uh, mm -mm. Uh, Daniel, could you uh, show next slide, please? Yeah. Yeah, that uh, orthogonality relation. So it's uh, uh, not standard, say. Yeah. So it's uh, not just a, a product, uh, a integral of product of two uh, functions. But from that point of view, uh, uh, are you sure that your eigenfunctions are linearly independent? See, I'm, I'm always. Okay, not always, but I'm concerned about it, without this, because we, uh, linearly independent means that we take one function and we can write it as a sum of uh, uh, all other, say, functions. So we can write series. Yeah. And uh, the, that orthogonality condition, if it's not a uh, uh, standard condition, like for uh, uh, trigonometric function sine and cosine, then this, co this condition, any other condition, they do not guarantee as I understand, that the uh, uh, system is uh, uh, linearly independent. Then you can find that uh, the 
uh, uh, one function, potentially, if you calculated that function, it can be uh, uh, presented as the series of all other functions with certain uh, coefficients. Right? Yeah. Potentially, this yeah. is possible. And then there is the interesting question, uh, uh, should we exclude such function or not? And the uh, uh, practice is saying, no, we still need to keep all of them. So that is interesting. So the, that is kind of, uh, there is a very deep uh, question, uh, I think, about uh, the properties uh, of that uh, eigenfunction. You, you said that your uh, operators, they are self-enjoyed, so the, then uh, it, it should help. But uh, because the, the, some other problems, they are more complicated than that. Yeah. And uh, still, uh, still, it's, it's uh, complicated enough. It's not all the generalized eigenvalue problem, but it, it's complicated. But it's not standard problem, right? Yeah. So then it would be uh, it would be uh, uh, interesting to ask that uh, or could be naive questions about the is it linearly independent? The another point is that uh, uh, another question is the system complete or not? But you said you proved it. Yeah. You proved it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just can you give a, 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 a Glue, glue. Uh, how you did it uh, uh, in few words? So we used a we used a theorem um, which basically I'm trying to think how to explain this very well. So I should have Robert mentioned that I should have put these. Uh, I should have written the theorem at the end in case anybody asked any questions about it. But I uh, couldn't fit it all on one slide. I uh, there's a theorem that basically says that if you if you have, if all of your functions and all of your operators satisfy a certain hypothesis and all of your function spaces uh, are, are correct, so you introduce things like Sobolov spaces and various different things, then there is a theorem that says if you can write your equation in a certain way, then it will permit a basis of functions for your for your space. And mm. I'll see if I can. If you have time, I'll be happy to show you. Um... We still have five minutes. Let me see. I'll just get. Stop sharing this. So it's it's not letting me uh, share the other. So I have the I have the document. Um, okay. Okay. So yeah. it, let me share the other yeah. screen. Yeah. We, we can uh, we can add the uh, uh, the kind of reference uh, to the. Um, uh, uh, to, to the video, uh, uh, your video presentation. Uh, this, this would be good. This uh, can help others to work on. The, uh, um, any other questions, by the way? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Plotnik, uh, Plotnikov? Yeah. Can you uh, unmute you? Yeah. Can you ask question? Yeah, Pavel. Hello. Uh, uh, oh, no. The, um, somebody, uh, no, one participant uh, raised a hand, but uh, uh, didn't, couldn't ask questions, I don't know. He, yeah, then uh, let me uh, ask another question. So uh, that uh, an, your analysis is, is based on linear shell theory. Kirchhoff love shell theory, yeah. Linear. Yeah. So it, this means that uh, you cannot describe collapse in particular. Um, so I, I don't know that much about Kirchhoff love shell theory. The, that was all covered in Robert's paper. 
Um, I yeah, know, yeah, but the linear means uh, small, small deflections. Right? Yeah, I yeah, think, yeah. Uh, generally speaking, right? Linear. So then the uh, uh, then uh, the uh, uh, that uh, cube laws you showed at the beginning, they are kind of more. They de they were designed more for kind of general case, including the collapse. But uh, your theory is more advanced. It's uh, uh, based on uh, uh, mathematical footing, but uh, it's uh, it's limited to uh, I believe it's limited to small deflections of, of the original shape. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Here, and um, uh, Robert mentioned that, uh, um, and uh, you said that uh, you uh, showed that the inertia effects were not included. Um, in in the inertia, just what was not was not included as part of yeah yeah, yeah. But the uh, yeah but the uh, is it possible uh, I, I do not suggest you to include them but uh, is it possible and uh, uh, there could be no reason to uh, account for inertia so uh, did you study that question uh, no I, I haven't I think um, that Robert's previous PhD student studied. Um, things to do with wall inertia. I, I haven't thought about that in my PhD yet. Yeah. Mm. Because if you if you consider, uh, I believe pulses going through the vein, then the inertia, the uh, uh, unsteady, uh, not unsteady, but the uh, like pulse uh, of uh, pressure going yeah. through, then the inertia could be. Uh, could be uh, important to include. Right? So, but uh, if the if, if the loads, if the change of the if change of the force, or the change of the flow is uh, slow, right? Then then it's okay. It's uh, understood. Including wall inertia is is certainly in something you would want to do in a model. Um, yeah. I am. Um, I think that for the purpose of what we were doing, it's already complicated enough. Um, yeah, 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 th yeah. There are some very, there are some simple tube laws that have been derived, which um, include um, what wall in, uh, effects from wall inertia as well. So they, they are included in some people's oh. work. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. At least uh, uh, I understand from your uh, way slides at the very beginning that uh, uh, it's possible kind of empirically uh, to generalize the tube law uh, to account for say, kind of uh, highly unsteady uh, uh, effects. Yeah. Yeah. The, then it will be not only uh, a derivative in that along the tube, but also derivatives in time in that yeah, tube yeah, exactly. law. And, yeah. But uh, the, it's uh, mathematically, I yeah, I do agree. It's very complicated. Yeah, it's very could be could be for uh, when you finish your PhD and uh, will be supervise your own PhD students and <laughs> you can give them. <laughs> this is a problem. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Please. Uh, we are almost uh, finishing. Yeah. Okay, no question. Then thank you very much, Daniel, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, it's um, a little bit uh, uh, unusual, say, presentation. It's more mathematical, but uh, we are in school of mathematics, so it's very good. Uh, it's uh, very reasonable, and uh, I'm happy that so uh, complicated mathematical problems are studied by our PhD students. So thank you, Daniel, and uh, many thanks to uh, Robert for uh, you know, the some uh, uh, explanation we are doing. Yeah, uh, good, uh, good job, very good job. Uh, thanks. The, uh, uh, then uh, this is the our last seminar uh, before Easter break. So uh, have a good, uh, have a happy uh, Easter, and uh, we will be back uh, uh, after the break. Uh, as I remember, next seminar will be on 29th uh, of uh, uh, April, and uh, there will be also interesting, uh, uh, interesting. Uh, uh
inter interesting talk, uh, both about hydrodynamics, about uh, psychology, about the uh, application of hydrodynamic in uh, uh, so-called gun violence. I don't know what's that, but uh, uh, it sounds uh, scary. <laughs> that will be presentation from New York, so they are <laughs> specialists in the guns. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, I uh, stop recording. Stop recording. All right.